Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers Podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers Podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Zach, do you want to start recording? Let's just get this stuff out there. We are up and rolling. All right. So, guys, we are on HPO podcast number, what, Zach? We 64, 65? I can't remember now. 65, I think. 65 with Dr. Jeff Stanley of Verta Health. And, uh, Jeff, uh, we're, we're so glad to have you on. There's been a lot of talk about Verta Health in the, you know, in the, in the low-carb community, and it has made some waves nationally. You know, Sarah Halberg's being one of the champions, Sammy Inikin being, I guess, the founder of the company, and a, and a bunch of uh, very uh, forward-looking doctors have, have – have, uh, sort of taken up this cause and you're one of the ones that I've seen. I, let me ask you, um, just tell me, can, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to, some of it's going to be from a selfish reason because you're doing a great, a lot of work for, you know, great work with patients, but I think there's probably some, some advantage for many physicians as well that, and we have a lot of physicians that listen to this stuff that might, you know, consider, you know, maybe this is something I might want to do with my career. You know, I'm not, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, many of us have been through, myself included, through the traditional medical route, and it's, it's kind of a grind, and there's a lot of negatives to that. But tell me about uh, how, you, you know, tell me a little bit about Verta Health, and then tell me about how you got started into it, and then we can get into some of the stuff you're doing with patients and, and some of the stuff as it pertains to physicians. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, first of all, I thanks so much for having me on, guys. I'm excited to chat with you. And, um, yeah, I just feel incredibly fortunate, I think, to be in a, a position of, you know, treating patients where most of my patients are, are getting better when I see them on, on repeat visits um, and then really being able to you know, support them with the lifestyle changes that, that they're motivated to make. Um, so just for kind of a, a brief background on Verda for, for folks who aren't familiar, um, so we're, we're basically a, an online uh, diabetes reversal clinic. Uh, so we were started back in 2014 by our founders, uh, Dr. Steve Finney, Dr. Jeff Volek, that I know Zach is familiar with, um, and then also, as you mentioned, Sami Inkinen. And it, that all kind of- I butchered his name, man. Sorry, man. <laughs> oh, no. he. Um, it's funny. It happens uh, all the time. He doesn't even correct people. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so Sami actually had reached out to them because he had this crazy idea of, of rowing across the Pacific Ocean uh, with, with his wife, Meredith Loring, and basically decided, you know, if I'm going to do this, I have to, you know, have the right nutrition and be able to, you know, support kind of the pounding that I'm going to take from, from doing this expedition. So he ended up, you know, getting connected with Steve and Jeff, and they gave him some advice on how to do it. I think the first advice was don't do it. And then subsequently, <laughs> they said, all right, if you're going to do it, you know, here's the way to fuel yourself so that you're not going to bonk in the middle of the ocean. Um, and so basically, you know, that connection and um, in addition, kind of an interesting side story is that Sami also had found out about their work through de uh, developing prediabetes despite being an Ironman world champion. So he really discovered that, you know, you can do everything that's quote unquote right and still be metabolically damaged. So, you know, they basically initially helped Sami and Meredith get across the ocean and then basically decided there's a huge opportunity to help a whole lot of people by giving them the right nutrition advice. And so it was the combination of their Know, decades of research, you know, Steve's done research in low carbohydrate diets going back to the late 70s. And so there's their combination of that along with Sami's know-how of starting a tech company. So he started the, the real estate company Trulia and built that kind of from the ground up. So the idea was, you know, not just how do we help a few handful of people, but how can we help people across the country and eventually the world with implementing a low carbohydrate approach and then giving them the, the one by one supervision that they need to be able to uh, be successful. And so I came about Verda basically, you know, I, I've been a long time, uh, 
proponent of low carbohydrate diets. Basically, it went back to me always being kind of a chubby kid and finding out eventually in college that if I cut out my carbohydrates, that I could lose weight and, you know, really keep it off pretty effortlessly. So over time, I started to use that with my patients, but I ran into, I think what a lot of probably docs who are listening in have run into is, you know, to be able to help people in a busy primary care clinic is nearly impossible. So you've got 15 minutes if you're lucky per patient. You've got you know sick people coming in and out. Um, and to be able to take the time to help someone understand a new dietary change and then put it into practice, um, it was really difficult. So I met uh, Sarah Hallberg and Steve and Jeff and basically knew that this was something I, I wanted to do. And I joined about three years ago and have been uh, really kind of li living the dream ever since. Jeff, how many, and just an aside to Zach, I know we, we hopefully will get uh, maybe Jeff Volick on the show. I know Zach, he said, we, he, he said he agreed to come on so we could, we could get him, talk to him about, you know, maybe Verta Health, but certainly a lot of the other things he's involved in. But how many physicians right now does Verta employ and where are you guys located? And do you practice nationwide or is it, you know, is, I'm sure it's license dependent. Are, are you, you know, do you kind of stick to a couple of states or how does that work for the, for the individual physicians? Yeah. So regarding licensing, I actually just, just a few months back, uh, got licensed in all 50 States now. So that was a, uh, several year ordeal that involves, you know, getting fingerprinted about a hundred times and sending in a bunch of redundant paperwork. Um, but with some help from some licensing agencies. Um, so now I'm basically have patients in all 50 States and in DC. Um, and then our team, we're, we're mostly, you know, the, the main Verta company is based in San Francisco. Um, but we've got a pretty significant number of folks in Denver and then Portland, Oregon, where I'm based, and then also kind of scattered across the country. So one of the things that's nice is that, you know, we don't have the, the need for the standard brick and mortar giant hospital to be able to treat folks because we're treating people, you know, via telemedicine online or, you know, over their, over, um, their, their smartphone. So in terms of the, the physician team, you know, we've got kind of a combination. We've got more than 10 sort of full-time docs that work with us. And then we've also have a few other docs that are in specific states where we have higher need for, for patients. Do you, do you guys have physicians that, that might do this part-time? Is that something that, you know, would, would be feasible for somebody who's considering to do this maybe, you know, one, one week a month or, you know, something like that to round out their practice? We, we do have some folks that are doing it part-time, you know, particularly kind of the onboarding portion of it. Um, and then, you know, when we have a patient who, who joins Verda as a full patient, you know, at that point, if they're, say, on insulin, then they'll have a specific Verda doctor who's following them and making med adjustments as needed. Um, but initially we do have lots of folks who've, you know, basically are passionate about what we're doing and, and joined uh, initially on a part-time basis. When I, when I, you know, when I did my residency, you know, many years ago, we, we did telemedicine, you know, I worked at the university, I was at the university of Texas system and part of our residency rotation was taking care of members of the Texas uh, department of corrections, so a lot of prisoners. And so, because it was such a security risk to move a lot of those people, we ended up doing a lot of a lot of virtual telemedicine type stuff, and there were some different challenges with that. You know, trying to do an orthopedic exam, you know, from distance was challenging. You'd have to have the nurse try to try to do stuff. So there were definitely some limitations there. What are you guys doing to solve some of that stuff? And I know you know diabetes is, is doesn't so much depend on physical exam. I mean, a lot of it's laboratory based, and so I think maybe that's one of the reasons why that sort of particular disease is, uh, you know, not that there aren't physical manifestations of diabetes, of course there are, but I mean, you know, you can kind of look at it from a, from, a, from a laboratory type thing, but what sort of technological things do you guys have in your arsenal that can help overcome some of the limitations that may have plagued, you know, telemedicine through the years? Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's been kind of a recent tipping point where it's just becoming so much easier to do this. You know, a lot of folks um, where we're working with patients, they're, you know, using their smartphone to do the video conference when we first meet. Um, we had I told one story. We actually had one patient who did their their uh, initial consultation sitting on a tractor during their lunch break. So mm -hmm. it really is, you know, it's very patient centered because people can do this on their break or, you know, go sneak into their office for a few minutes and, and 
and have their consultation. So, you know, we, we are a little bit limited in terms of, you know, listening to people's heart and lungs or, you know, the physical exam portions of it. Um, but really in terms of getting, when someone first joins, we would get, have a consultation, you know, with a Verta physician and we talk via telemedicine. So kind of similar to a Zoom meeting like this. Um, and we're getting a full diabetes history. So, to, you know, whether they've ever had DKA, their history of medications, any complications, things like that. And then, you know, we're able to kind of dive in also a lot about their, their motivation for making the changes and other life circumstances that might come into it. Um, we still have people have a primary care doctor, so we're not taking over primary care. Um, but I've, I've found that actually it's, it's been surprisingly easy overall. And I think particularly with, with the teleconferencing now, you know, you can see face to face, you're looking in someone's eyes. Um, it's actually better, I think, than a lot of doctor visits where the docs kind of, you know, got their back turned to you and their heads buried in the, the electronic health record. So, you know, there, there's the initial part of it, which is to, to figure out, you know, the person's back medical history. And then on an ongoing basis, we're gathering things like glucose, ketones, blood pressure, uh, weight, and any symptoms they might be having. And we're able to, you know, figure out if any of those are worrisome and intervene as needed. So a lot of times it's just reducing medications to keep people safe. Um, but we can also troubleshoot if somebody's, you know, say feeling dizzy or having other issues. Yeah, Jeff, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, we've talked about this in some of the other podcast episodes that it, there's just like this massive hurdle with, with, uh, like, just the general healthcare procedures right now, because it's, it's hard to, for people, I think, to find the time and get through the logistics of even going into the doctor. And then when they get there, it's like the doctor has X amount of patients they need to see. And uh, they end up getting black because they don't have more than you know, 10, 15 minutes to spend with the patient. So automatic. So just by default, you know, some of the stuff gets like glossed over or missed altogether. And it seems like what you guys have going is you've eliminated a lot of those logistical hurdles and freed up some of that time so you can actually spend a little more time with the patient and getting to know what their specific needs are and kind of develop a, an action plan more or less. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think what's really important with that is to allow various healthcare providers to sort of practice to the greatest extent of, of their abilities. So we have health coaches that are really well versed on the intricacies of the diet and in motivating people and troubleshooting and things like that. So, you know, quite, quite honestly, it's probably not the best use of time for a you know, medically trained physician to be giving the full nitty gritty of the dietary advice. You know, you've got someone else who can do that and um, frankly better at it. And then you use your physicians to be able to monitor blood pressure, blood glucose, um, troubleshoot any you know, concerning symptoms, things like that. And, you know, I think there's been a move to do that in other parts of medicine, but in general, um, you know, what I always say is I, I was previously a primary care doc for a number of years. And, you know, I think it's really one of the hardest jobs in medicine, if not the, of all, all jobs, because there's so many things that you've got to take care of. And, you know, someone might come in for that 15 minute visit and you want to help them to change their diet, but they're there because their knee hurts. And then you've got to convince them to get a colonoscopy and the flu shot and the 10 other things that they need to do. Um, so it's just, I think what it allows people to do on both sides is to focus on what is most important for them. So primary care docs have their job that's extremely important. And then we can kind of take a piece of their work off their plate and, and help them out a bit. Jeff, how many, uh, I mean, are you do this full time, I guess, or are you doing it from an office? Do you go to an office? You do from your, can you do it from your home? Uh, how many patients do you see, see a day typically like new patient versus I guess a follow up? And then how much time do you get with, with a patient? Yeah. So I, um, basically, um, full time with Verda and have it been early February will be about my, my three year mark, um, working with, with the team. And I, I'm in Portland, Oregon. We, ha I have a, an office that I go to for my, um, call them H and P's. Um, a lot of that is because I've got three kids under seven and the, uh, the risk of somebody wandering into the consultation is a little bit too high. Um, so I'll do that at times if they're in school or, or, or daycare or things, but in general, I, I'm at my office right now. It's a little bit of a, a quiet spot to be able to see folks. And it really varies. So, you know, I'll be, you know, on any given day, you know, seeing data and reviewing and making changes in, you know, hundreds to thousands of patients. Um, and then it really varies on the day in terms of doing new, um, new patient visits. So sometimes, you know, probably between five and 10 a day. And, you know, it's usually about 30 minutes for, for a visit. 
but it, it varies a lot. We have some people who have a lot of questions and, and some people who have, um, you know, gotten all the info they need and are kind of ready to start. Do you guys, I know you guys are set up for diabetes and we can talk about your results. I know, I know that some of your results have been published and, and, and there's been some controversy about it, but, but in general, you know, at least most people in the low carb community sort of use your, 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 your data as something that's very encouraging, but what, are you guys treating anything else besides diabetes or is it just only diabetes? I mean, surely, I mean, there's some overlap. I mean, I certainly see in people I run into that adopt you know, a, a low carbohydrate diet, or even as crazy as what I do as a carnivorous diet, we see all sorts of resolution of, you know, whether it's gastrointestinal issues or mental health issues or joint pain and all those types of things. Do you guys, what happens when, when, when that sort of stuff comes up? Do you guys say, no, I can't treat that and, and just push it away? Or do you, you know, refer them back to their primary care physician or do you kind of deal with that stuff too? Yeah, so you know our our main focus is on type two diabetes, um, but we do treat people with prediabetes or metabolic syndrome, obesity, and we have had some folks who've reached out to us who are dealing with you know autoimmune diseases, so things like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, and you know kind of like you mentioned, anecdotally, we've seen some pretty amazing improvements in in people's symptoms. You know, I have a couple of patients who, you know, threw away their cane that they were using because of their their inflammatory arthritis, um, or people who were able to get off some of the nasty you know immune modulating drugs that that they use. Um, it's something that we're hoping to study a little more in depth. So we have a, um, in addition to the clinical trial, we also do a, a patient registry. So anybody who signs up for Verda through their employer or directly can opt in to basically an, an ongoing registry that we're looking at. We're going to publish data from that. So we're trying to keep track of things like, again, autoimmune disease or, or um, you know, uh, IBS or, or things like that that tend to improve. And so I'm always careful about, you know, over promising or, or seeing things that could just be random anecdotes. Um, but it's happening so often that I, I don't know, I, I think that there's something there. Yeah, I mean, hey Jeff. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on some of that and maybe dive in a little deeper on one of those areas is because with you guys, with your focus on, on diabetes, it seems like in a lot of cases, sometimes that comes along with folks who, who have a substantial amount of weight to lose to kind of help with some of that stuff. And uh, I know some of this has kind of piqued the interest, I think, of the general public, partly due to some comments by, uh, was it Julian Michaels, about <laughs> kind of the efficacy of a low-carb diet. Um, and then I'm, she got some backlash, at, as you would imagine. Um, but I think what, what was interesting about that whole ordeal was I, it somewhat brought to light some, some stuff that I think it was uh, Kevin Hall, if I'm not mistaken, has been looking at the last few years with uh, a lot of the contestants from The Biggest Loser uh, and just like what types of things are occurring physiologically after that, that sort of a setup where they're, they're losing just tons of weight in a short period of time. Uh, just with the way the body responds to that and kind of how the body more or less seems to be fighting a specific set point or a weight point. And then when you deviate too far from that, uh, it responds in kind. And what they were seeing with a lot of the folks that they followed up with was after that weight loss, when they looked at what their resting metabolic rate should have been, it was sometimes five to even 800 calories less than what they would expect someone that size to have. And uh, I'm just curious what, if anything, you are seeing kind of with the, with the keto approach or the high fat, low carb approach. Uh, do you guys have information on that? Or is that something you look at? Are people who are losing weight, are they having a different experience with their new resting metabolic rate? Or are they also having to kind of fight that uphill battle of how do I get my metabolism back to where it would be um, in an ideal situation? Yeah, no, that's, that's an excellent question and obviously kind of a controversial area. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that, that definitely, like you mentioned in like the biggest loser study or where Kevin Hall looked at people's resting metabolic rate, it does really seem like when people lose weight rapidly and when they lose it through kind of that combination of starvation and over exercise, you know, it really tends to just bottom out their metabolic rate. So, um, and, and what that tends to come with is then people regain the weight pretty rapidly and oftentimes even sort of overshoot their initial weight. And there's some pretty crazy things when you look at that 
Biggest Loser study where there are people who are now back like 20 pounds over their starting weight, but their metabolic rate is 500, um, you know, slower than it was when they first uh, began. <laughs> so it's, um, it, it, may, it definitely makes it an uphill battle. And we know in general, like when people lose weight, um, the body really fights hard to do it. So even in the setting of whether it's ketogenic diet or intermittent fasting or whatever, the approach people use, the body's always going to kind of fight back against losing the weight and keeping it off. Um, but overall, I mean, what we've seen is people, you know, lose the weight pretty fairly quickly and, and kind of at a, a sustainable clip uh, with, with our approach. And then, you know, when you look at the weight loss, like at a, a year, it's at about 12% of, of body weight. And there's not that big U-shaped curve, which usually happens where people lose the weight and then they hit some point and they gain it back. Um, so we, we don't have the, the resting metabolic data on our patients at this point. It's something we'd love to, to look into in the future. Um, but I think the fact that people aren't regaining the weight at a, you know, at a um, fast clip, the fact that they're staying pretty stable um, and that they're kind of eating in a sustainable way would argue that, you know, maybe they're not having that big um, re reduction in the metabolic rate. Um, and, and I think one of the other things that's interesting is that people will often argue that, oh, well, just, you know, the improvements that you get in something like diabetes is just because you lose weight. And they'll say, you know, any improvements in glucose or getting off meds is strictly due to the number of pounds that you lost. And the interesting thing is that we see you know, people get off meds quickly. So, you know, someone who maybe has lost five pounds in the first couple of weeks might be completely off 20 units of insulin. So for me, that argues that it definitely, it, it's not just weight loss. There's also this interplay of, of what you're eating. Hey, Jeff, let me, because uh, there's a couple of interesting points there. And yes, I've seen, you know, I've seen people that go on these diets that aren't overweight, that are thin to begin with, and they, and they solve a lot of these health issues. So clearly, it's not all down to weight loss for sure. I mean, I've seen that, you know, even with joint pain, I'm seeing people before they lose any weight, their knee pain gets better, so on and so forth. But one of the points you brought up and one of the major criticisms that I guess we should, we should go into what diet you guys are actually practicing for the people that don't know, and maybe we can talk specifically on what, what your dietary strategy is. But one of the criticisms of a low carb diet or a ketogenic diet, or even, you know, a carnivorous diet is it's not sustainable. You can't do it. You know, it's, it's, it's something, it's, it's, it's just a temporary state but you guys are demonstrating with the right support that that is, tends to be very sustainable. And, 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 you know, there's countless, again, anecdotes of people that have been doing these diets for, you know, many years and even decades without any problem. And so where is this sort of unsustainability coming from? Uh, and, and what are you guys doing to sort of prove that that's not the case? And talk about your support system, because I think that's an important part of the puzzle. Yeah. So to answer kind of the first part of the question around, you know, what approach we use, and as, as you mentioned, I haven't really gone specifically into it. So we use a basically personalized carbohydrate restriction. And with the idea being at least initially, we're aiming for a nutritional ketosis, which would be a, a beta hydroxybutyrate level of about 0 0.5 to, you know, somewhere 1.5 to 2.5 millimolar. And that's basically achieved through, you know, restricting carbohydrates to less than 30 grams total per day, initially uh, getting adequate protein and then basically fat to satiety after that point. Um, the, the thing that's an important point to note though, is that that isn't for everybody from day one through as long as they're, they're with us. You know, it ends up being um, some people very much thrive being in ketosis and want to stay there. And we have other people who, you know, I had one guy tell me, you know, I want you to tell me the exact amount of carbs I can eat without getting diabetes again. And so we can do that because we're tracking their numbers. Um, but in general, you know, I think in our, our clinical trial, the average beta hydroxybutyrate level is about 0 0.3 at a year. So people are kind of on that. They're not super high in ketosis, but they're kind of in that range. Um, and then with the sustainability, you know, what, what I've always thought is that, you know, there's been kind of an uphill battle for people who are trying to do a low carb approach or a ketogenic approach because the food environment is so difficult, right? And then also people are oftentimes telling them, whether it's their doctor or their, their, their aunt or whoever it is telling them, don't do it, it's dangerous. And so first of all, what we do is we say, look, here's the data showing it's safe. 
And then we say, here's a coach who's going to help you to do it, which means that, you know, when you inevitably fall off the wagon and eat something you shouldn't, it's not like all is lost. All you need to do is the next day or the next meal, you start back on things. And, you know, again, that was something I couldn't do when I was a PCP because I would see someone in three months and they would say, oh, I did great. And I went on vacation and thing, you know, the wheels fell off basically. So, you know, by having that support and by having a, you know, I think having a physician telling them this is how to do it, this is what we're watching. Um, and then the the day to day coaching, um, basically what we saw in the, the clinical trial population was about 84% of folks were still with Verda on the trial at the end of a year, um, which is, you know, I think great sustainability from them. not to say that everyone was doing perfectly, but they were all still generally trying to follow the advice and, uh, you know, working, working with us still. Do you find there's a, there's like a tipping point as to where, you know, if you make it X amount of period of time, then you can kind of coast, you know, it's like, you know, is there like, if they can stay, maintain it out for six months, then they can do it long term. Is there any data that suggests there's a time frame people need to be able to sustain it for? What's interesting is that that we've seen that a lot of times, you know, the it, it's really getting past the first couple weeks to a month, I think, where, where people get over that hump. Uh, and a lot of that, it, it seems to be that, you know, someone starts and then, you know, either they have a some sort of a life event that comes up or there's been an ongoing struggle with a family or something going on that just sort of makes it very clear that this is not the right time for them. So in general, that's kind of what we see. And I haven't seen too many folks who start the diet and then say, I just don't like this. It tastes bad or I can't stick with it. It tends to be a bit more of just crazy things going on in their life that make it tough for them to stay. Um, but even when someone gets past six months, it's not always smooth sailing. Like what'll happen is something will pop up and then we can address that when it happens and, and get them back into, you know, a few, a few months of smooth sailing. Hey, let me, let me just, uh, a sole point you brought up was the, the sort of the uh, adequate protein. What do you guys, has that recommendation changed? I know we've seen a lot of sort of back and forth in the ketogenic community about what is adequate protein. I'm, I'm in the camp that, you know, plenty of protein is fine. Where, where, do, you, where do you guys fall at on the protein uh, side right now? Yeah, obviously, that's another kind of controversial area, um, you know, and, and with the traditional ketogenic diet for epilepsy, which is very protein limited, you know, we're definitely not in the, the low protein camp um, in that regard. But, you know, I think in our, our official recommendations are about 1.2 to 2 kilograms um, of uh, reference body weight for folks. Um, and and it, what's interesting is it very much seems to vary by person. So we have some people who are, you know, very insulin resistant, overweight, inactive. And we actually find that in, in their case, when they eat too much protein, it can kind of stall their results a little bit, like their ketones won't be as high, or they can get a bit of whether it's gluconeogenesis or, or whatever it is making their, their glucose a bit higher. Um, but then we have other people who go to that upper level, upper range of the key, of the protein and do great. So particularly in folks who are active and have, I think, more muscle mass to begin with. Um, and one of the things that's nice is that because we can track the beta hydroxybutyrate, we can really personalize it to the individual and not give these sort of blanket recommendations of either super high protein or super low protein. Do you find, uh, Jeff, do you find that, is there a direct linear correlation between the amount of beta hydroxy butyrate in, in the blood and, and weight loss. I mean, there, again, there's some people that say, as long as you're in ketosis, you know, being really high really doesn't make that much difference. You maybe you're, you maybe you're, you're wake, you're making more, but you're not utilizing as much. You maybe you're wasting more. I mean, it's, it seems like, you know, particularly in athletes, I know, I think Vinny and uh, Finney and Bullock have actually shown this, that, that sometimes they're longtime athletes. I know Zach, I think has been part of this is it shows that these people adapt to it and they tend to run a little bit lower level of baseline ketosis. Is that what you, you know, I know you guys are using that as a metric, but do you find that that is a direct linear correlation to, to your results, ketone levels? Yeah. So I know we've looked at that in the past and the, the answer was that it didn't seem to be a really clear correlation between, you know, higher ketones and, and better success. Um, it seemed to be that, you know, it's a, it's a good um, marker for carbohydrate restriction. 
Um, it can be thrown off a little bit if someone's, you know, chugging bulletproof coffee and, you know, taking MCT oil and things like that. Obviously that can, can change things a little bit, or if they just tend to skip meals, you know, that'll, that'll cause the, the ketones to be a bit higher. Um, so, you know, we don't really strive for, for super high ketones. You know, we, a lot of times have to talk people off the ledge a little bit of saying, you know, it's fine to be 0 0.5, you know, that's, that's good. Or even 0 0.3 or 0 0.4, you know, we actually have, I have a couple of patients who've been incredibly successful and, you know, one in particular, she could not get over 0.3. And she was, she was like sending messages saying, oh, I'm a failure. I just, I don't know why I'm not doing this. And I had to remind her like, no, you're off 30 units of insulin. You've lost 50 pounds. <laughs> you feel great. You know, the, the numbers don't, it's just the way that your body utilizes the ketones. Yeah. So we don't sweat it too much. And, and I've noticed that myself. So I've been eating a ketogenic diet for about four years now. And with time, my numbers just don't get that high anymore. I'm probably fairly consistently like 0.5 to 0.8 or somewhere in that range. Yeah. One thing, you know, I've always noticed when I have tested blood ketones is that it seems like if I go out and, and do a hard workout or any, really any longer workout, even if it's not that hard is if I would test right when I get back, I actually have some of my lower blood ketone levels. And then if I wait just a little bit, like maybe an hour or two and test again, um, you know, it, it, it raises back up a little bit. Um, and then sometimes even if, uh, if the next meal I have isn't, doesn't have carbs in it, you know, they'll see it shoot up again after that. Uh, so like my understanding is that some of that is more or less just like you, when you can imagine, like if you're, if you're keto adapted or high fat, low carb, you go out for a run or something that's energy expensive, your body's going to be trying to utilize a lot lot of the resources it has. So is, is it, is this an issue of just some of the, the blood ketones being taken up fast, fast enough that it doesn't show up as much in the blood or is it like an efficiency thing? Is, do you have any uh, kind of info along those lines? Yeah. You know, this is a, a bit out of my, my wheelhouse, but I, you know, my, my theories around it and I've seen the same thing where it seems to be the, you know, particularly kind of higher intensity bouts of exercise. Mm -hmm sort of lower ketones versus, you know, like people, if I go out for a really long, slow walk or something like that, that tends to be my higher levels of ketones. So I think, you know, particularly when someone's adapted, you know, it makes sense that you've got kind of the cellular machinery to burn ketones and fatty acids, and you're going to be using those, you know, when you're exerting yourself. And that's why I think also when somebody first starts, you know, particularly we'll see that where someone is, you know, kind of young and healthy, who doesn't have diabetes, who's starting a ketogenic diet, you know, they can get their ketones to four the first week. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is, I think they're basically just peeing them out. You know, they're not really, they're not really using them at that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, that's, that's been my experience. And I know Sami's done some kind of personal tests where he'll, he'll end a workout with some sprints and then check ketones and they just, you know, they bottom out for, you know, a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've even noticed it, like, it, it does seem like the harder the session, the longer maybe it takes to kind of have that renormalize more or less. I just, I did a stretch on one of my last training blocks where I was checking a couple times, two, three times a day, just to kind of get an idea of what, if anything had changed since I had last done that type of a uh, detailed check. And uh, I think the, 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 my hardest workout was took me the longest to get back in after throughout that training block. And so I was just curious if there was any type of, you know, consistency with that across the board, but it sounds like there's at least something to it. Yeah. And th there is some variability too with, with our individual patients where we have some, it seems to be that certain kinds of exercise people just react differently to. We'll have some folks that when they exercise their ketones look great afterwards. And then again, other people where it kind of bottoms out. So it's, yeah, it's something I'm, I'd love to learn more about, but it's not, you know, not something I'm terribly familiar with. Now for a word from our sponsors. This episode of HPO Podcast is brought to you by a company named Fat Snacks. That's Fat Snacks with an X. Fat Snacks is a company that makes a cookie that is keto, low carb, and high fat. They use ingredients like almond flour, coconut flour, and butter to make a soft bake cookie with one to two net grams of carbs and eight grams of fat per cookie. It comes in flavors such as chocolate chip, lemon, and peanut butter. 
This personally is a, an option that I've used in the past when I'm traveling, when I'm in a situation where I might be busy and on the go for quite some time and just there's a scarcity of what I would consider high quality food options. This is a great thing that's easy to pack and bring along and uh, get you out of a pinch in a situation like that. Uh, I also see this as a really great option for parents with children who want to send them to school, to practice or to a friend's house and don't want them to overdo some of the more traditional options that are sugar and vegetable oil based cookies. Uh, if you'd like to check out this product, please head over to their website at fatsnacks.com and with the promo code HPO, you can get 5% off your first single order or 10% off a subscription order. Also, if you get a chance, head over to Instagram and Facebook and give them a follow or a shout out at Eat Fat Snacks and let them know that HPO is very grateful for their support. Now, back to the show. Hey, Jeff, let me ask you, uh, it seems like more and more, at least some people are starting to recognize that when it comes to diabetic pathophysiology, you know, insulin has a pretty big role here. It's not just what your blood glucose. And so are you guys looking at all at insulin levels. I know when we had Jason Fong on the show, he said he was utilizing that, but, but still that can be very variable. It's just not as a reliable marker, maybe things like uh, C-peptide levels and stuff like that. Are those things you guys are, are, are taking interest in? Yeah, so we definitely are, are tracking all of that in the, in the clinical trial and, and publishing it. So we have data on you know, the HOMA IR and looking at insulin levels with time. And we certainly saw, you know, a, a reduction in, in insulin levels and improvement in the, the HOMA IR score. Um, it's not something we routinely do with, with our, our sort of standard patients, um, you know, in general, because it's not changing a whole lot about how we, you know, how we practice. We still give fairly similar advice and track the glucose. Um, um, the one thing that's interesting, you mentioned the C-peptide, um, that's something that we'll often check in folks who have longstanding type 2 diabetes and are on insulin. Um, and basically what we're trying to figure out is, you know, do they have kind of a cold type 1 diabetes that hasn't been uncovered yet? And that happened with a few folks in the clinical trial where basically Dr. Hallberg got them off insulin and then it was kind of clear that their glucose was going up and you know they, they seemed to need a small amount um so you know that that's something that we'll routinely do but what's interesting is even folks with really low c peptides if you work with them for enough time and you can improve their insulin sensitivity, get them to lose weight um, get them to be adherent to the diet um, we've actually seen people with pretty low C peptides get completely off insulin. It's just that they, they don't have very much wiggle room. You know, if they, if they eat carbs, they'll, you know, pretty quickly kind of overwhelm their body's ability to, to make enough insulin. Yeah. I guess we should interject what C peptide is. So when, when, when the body makes insulin, it cleaves part of it. And that part is a C peptide, uh, you know, molecule or, and so that kind of indicates it's a proxy measure of what insulin does. And it tends to be a little more I think it tends to be a little more accurate, some people believe, as far as what your insulin production is. Exactly. Yeah, it's sort of like a byproduct. So it, it gives us an idea of how much insulin you know, your body is actually making. Let's talk a little bit about the clinical trial now, because I think that is you know, one of the feathers in the, in the verdict cap right now. You guys have done a, I know it's been at least a one-year trial, and I think it's ongoing, and so you're getting more data on that. So talk about the sort of the results you've gotten and then contrast that to some of the other clinical trials that have looked at the same things. I know there's people that will say, well, you know, we, we have a whole food plant-based diet and we can do this with diabetes. How does your results stack up against some of these other, other uh, dietary schemes? Yeah. So to, to give kind of a quick background just on the, the setup of the trial and how it's been going. So it's been since about 2015, we're running this, this um, kind of the largest trial of its kind uh, in Lafayette, Indiana, with uh, Dr. Sarah Hallberg as the, um, the PI. And it's interesting. So she actually had been, you know, using this approach with in a, um, the Indiana University Health Medical Weight Loss Clinic and had published some um, sort of, you know, anecdotal patient uh, data. And then she had randomly run into Steve Finney at a conference and kind of came up to him and said, we're doing a study together. <laughs> and so within a few months, they actually had IRB approval and realized that, you know, that, that Verda could help to run the trial and to provide the, um, the nutritional advice for patients. So it's been basically, it was originally approved for two years, um, but we've actually extended it out to five years now. 
And it's a, um, it's, so it's a non-randomized trial, but it's a prospective interventional trial. We've got about 262 folks with, with type 2 diabetes and then about another 100 with uh, pre-diabetes. And then there's also a control arm of about 80-something folks who are basically recruited from the same area in, in Lafayette, and they get ongoing treatment by an, an endocrinologist, their primary care doc, and a dietitian. So the idea was to look at, you know, what is kind of the standard care group, and you know, what, what trajectory do we expect for them versus somebody who's getting this more intensive um, treatment. So basically, you know, Dr. Hallberg's their doc, and then they've got a, a health coach, and they work on on the the Verda app. And the, the one-year data has been published. Uh, the two-year data is in peer review right now. So that should be, you know, we'll be able to discuss that pretty soon. Um, and again, it will, we're also going to publish out to, to five years to really give people an idea of what happened. It's kind of the, the big take-home points for it was we saw about an average of a 1.3-point reduction in hemoglobin A1c. Well, which is good, but the important thing to remember is also that we were taking people off of meds. So it was the combination of stopping meds and you know, lowering the A1C. We had about, I think 94% of people either got off their insulin or had a significant reduction. Um, and we saw about 60% of the folks that finished were basically below the diabetes threshold and, um, and off of everything but metformin in, in some cases. So we consider that as being a diabetes reversal, which means that you know, they have to continue the dietary changes. It's not like a magical cure that'll last forever. Um, but by doing that, they basically are able to have normal, normal glucose without taking meds that'll, that'll bottom them out. Are you aware of any other dietary interventions or, or, or even drug interventions that have had that kind of result? Uh, with treating so, diabetes. I mean, I think there's, there's a few things that would be, you know, somewhat comparable. So first of all, if you're thinking about like bariatric surgery, you know, it has, has pretty dramatic results um, in terms of diabetes reversal or remission. Um, you know, interestingly, there, we're often kind of criticized for not having it be a randomized trial, but there, there aren't randomized trials of bariatric surgery, you know, show, showing this, these results. <laughs> it would be tough, so to, that would tough to do that, to, to randomize it, to double blind the patient on that would be kind of tough, wouldn't it? Right. You know, they do some of those sham surgeries now, but I think it would become pretty, pretty obvious quickly. Um, and then, you know, there's the, the direct study that was done in, in England where they used the, the 800 calorie like meal replacement. Um, and that had, you know, I, I, I can't remember the exact numbers. I think it didn't have quite as high of levels of, of diabetes reversal or remission. They had about, I think, a one point drop in A1C. Um, one of the things, so that was a randomized trial. Although looking at it, they, it was randomized in a, as a cluster randomized fashion. So basically they said, this clinic is going to get the intervention and this clinic won't. And then within those clinics, the doctors could choose which patients were going to do the shakes or not. So it's not truly, you know, just randomly picking one person versus another. Um, but it is, you know, obviously a, a little bit higher level of evidence. Um, and interestingly, though, their patients were less sick than, the, than our Verda cohort. So none of their patients were on insulin, and we had about 30% of, of patients on insulin. Um, and they had an average duration of diabetes of about four years, I believe. And in, in Verda, it was about eight. So you know, even though ours wasn't a randomized controlled trial, we still have a, a fairly high level of acuity in terms of how sick the patients were. Hey, Jeff, let's talk about the, the, you know, you said 60% were, quote, unquote, reversed of diabetes, cured, of, you know, the semantics get a little kind of, kind of goofy, because, you know, there's people that define it different ways, but 60% clearly are much, much improved based on things like hemoglobin A1C. The 40% that did not get there, what do we know about those folks? Is there any sort of commonality you can say, well, this is going on in the, this particular population, were they sicker to begin with? Do they have more comorbidities? What were the things that would, or has that been looked at yet? Yeah, so you know, of that forty percent, the vast majority still saw you know good and excellent improvements. So you know, one of the issues is that you know, for people who started quite a bit above an A1C of six point five, you know, I think the average is if somebody started at nine, uh, an A1C above nine, then the average drop was about two to three points. 
So they had a big drop, but they still, you know, basically had further to go in terms of getting in that diabetes reversal range. You know, there's a small percentage of patients who just weren't able to consistently follow it or did well initially and then kind of fell off the wagon a bit. So I don't know the percentage of that, but, you know, it's probably less than 5% of folks who didn't really have much of an improvement and the rest saw those improvements, but maybe weren't able to get completely off their meds or weren't able to get the A1C below 6.5 yet. Joe, no, if, oh, go ahead, go oh, I was just going to ask uh, just to go along with it. Cause I think it's, well, you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting about Verta is it provides that kind of ongoing support and it gives people that, that, like reassurance that they're not going at this on their own, or it's like this, this massive uh, undertaking that they're going to have to do trial and error on to have that your database available to see like, well, what's working for other people. And you mentioned that you, you still try to work closely with kind of their general practitioner. Um, have you found that that has been a very positive interaction or are you getting some kickback or pushback, I should say from some of the um, general practitioners as to why that, you're taking this route or uh, cause some, sometimes I wonder if it's, you know, you give the support that there people like the dietitians and the general practitioners are a little more open to maybe exploring these when they know that the person has the level of support that, you know, Verda can maybe provide. Yeah. You know, o- overall I've been, uh, pleasantly surprised by, by the support from, from, you know, GPs and, and primary care docs. Uh, you know, a lot of it, I, I've been given talks to, to docs for several years, like in my old job as a PCP, and there used to be a bit more pushback about, you know, is this safe? What's the evidence for it? And, you know, luckily with, with more data coming out, I think that definitely, and, and becoming more mainstream, I think people are more open to the possibility that this might be useful. Um, and I think also, you know, just recently over the last couple months, the American Diabetes Association uh, noted low carbohydrate diets as being a medical nutritional therapy that's approved or, or, you know, as an option for patients. And that's, it was never like, you know, outlawed, but it definitely is is more accepted at this point. Um, So that's been easier. And, you know, what we find, I'd say the most common response I get from PCPs is basically saying, you know, if you can do anything to make my patient healthier, then I'm all for it. And if you can offer this support, you know, a lot of times they hear like, well, we don't have enough dietitians here, or our dietitians only see, you know, folks with certain eating disorders or things like that. So, you know, they appreciate, I think, the extra bandwidth. Uh, and I actually uh, call quite a few of the docs just to follow up and see, you know, what if they have any recommendations or concerns. And it's been pretty uniformly positive. We have a few folks who initially just don't know what we're doing and worry about someone new taking care of their patient. Um, but we basically provide ongoing updates and keep them in the loop on any changes that we've made. So it's really only been, I'd say, a handful of folks who've, who've pushed back. Um, and in the long run, they've ended up being kind of, I think, won over by the results. Jeff, I've got three points. I don't know if you can keep them all in your head. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> the first one is, well, let's talk a little bit about blood lipids, because one of the criticisms of a low-carb di- diet, you know, particularly one that contains potentially more, more saturated fats, even though I don't know if that's totally true, but but but... <laughs> may negatively impact blood leopard lipids, particularly when we look at things like LDL cholesterol. So how do you, what, what are you guys finding? How do you deal with that? What are your thoughts on that? The second question is, is probably a simple one is how do insurance companies, do you accept insurance to the insurance companies? Are they getting, are you getting a good vibe for those guys? And then the third question is as a physician, how has this impacted you from a, from a, just from a, you know, quality of life and satisfaction it, 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 some practicing medicine? Yeah, so to, to address the, the lipid question, obviously that, that's something that comes up pretty commonly uh, and you know, something that we're concerned about and are looking at. So in the clinical trial population, what we found overall was that there was about a, a 10% increase in the, the LDL-C, um, the LDL cholesterol. Um, we saw that there was an increase in the HDL and there was a, um, like about a 40%, I think, reduction in triglycerides. And interestingly, when you put those together, along with blood pressure, and you plug them into the heart disease risk calculator, we saw on average about a 12% reduction in the calculated risk. Um, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things where the whole picture, it actually looks like a more beneficial uh, change in lipids. The thing that's important to note, though, is that 
you know, there, there ends up being a fair amount of personalization. So if we have the rare person that might have a big jump in their lipids, we talk to them about what that might mean. Um, now we don't obviously have a crystal ball. We don't know how much a change in lipids like that, if it matters very much or not, but based on the, the sort of traditional way of treating it, um, we at least talk to them about a statin medication. We tell them about the risk potentially involved, and then we make a decision together with them. Um, so we don't force anyone to take a statin. We also don't you know, try to scare people off from, from taking them as they need. Um, but I think the big take home point overall is to let's not make recommendations based on populations. Like, like let's look at the individual person. So we have a lot of people who have a huge drop in their LDL and everything else improves. And so, you know, why would you tell that person don't do a low carb diet because in this study, you know, the, the whole group had an increase um, because in that individual, you know, everything looks quote unquote perfect. Um, and then the, the second question you had was oh, around insurance companies. Yeah. So most of our patients right now actually come uh, paid for by their employer. So as you know, in the U.S., a lot of healthcare is employer-based. And so people, you know, we work with like Nielsen, the, the ratings company or Purdue University or the Chickasaw Nation. And they basically decided that they want to cover the whole Verda treatment for at least a year for their, their employees who have diabetes. And they pay an upfront cost. And then we've actually moved now towards outcomes-based payments. So we basically only get paid if the individual patient is successful. So it's not the average of the whole group. It's did this particular patient get off their meds and have an A1C drop. Um, and then we're also kind of in, in negotiations with larger insurance companies and healthcare systems. Uh, it's a really slow process. Their, their sales cycles are like a year, two years in advance. Um, but it's been interesting because I, that, that's part of my job as well as I talk to medical directors and chief medical officers. And there's been just this huge shift in the last year with how, how open and receptive they are to this approach. You know, a lot of it is just figuring out how do we pay for it? How, who do we pilot? it with first. Um, so I think it, I'm, I'm very um, optimistic about it spreading to a, to a wider group. Jeff, that's kind of a follow-up to the, the lipid puzzle. One other thing I'm kind of curious about is just in general, like uh, some of these blood markers that you may have, uh, you know, got data pool for uh, kind of like when I first got into low carb, high fat, you know, one thing that was interesting to me was well, what does this mean for like different ranges of certain uh, micronutrients and does, is there a shift in like what is an ideal range for someone following a higher fat approach versus someone following a more standard American diet? Since it seems like our current recommendations are more or less based on a standard American diet. Have you seen anything like that where there's trends that when people follow a high fat, low carb diet, they're either a lot higher or lower in certain nutrients? Yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure on the, on the micronutrients. I mean, I think that's an excellent point around that these, these normal ranges are based on the average population. And I think we've seen even over the years that normal ranges have shifted as people have gotten sicker in general. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think until we get a really large cohort of patients following this approach, um, you know, I think we, we won't quite know, you know, what, what those ranges are. I mean, some of the ones that we folk, we do focus on is, you know, getting plenty of magnesium. That's one where people, uh, I don't know, the low carb approach in some cases seems to kind of unearth some cramps and magnesium deficiency that people have. So we tend to stay on top of either getting magnesium through veggies or, you know, through, through supplementation. Um, potassium is another one. Um, and then, you know, the other sort of, you know, like zinc and other things I'm, I'm not quite sure on. Um, but we tend to sort of look for any concerning symptoms that might sig uh, signify a um, low level. Let me, let me just, this is another, uh, I'll just shift gears. I know, I know Stephen Finney has written at least on this a little bit. Do you guys run into people with thyroid issues? Uh, I know one of the concerns about a low carb diet is it causes people's thyroid hormones sometimes to be low uh, are you seeing that? And, and, you know, more importantly, when I talk about this, I, I always try to put it in context of clinical, you know, the actual clinical pr presentation rather than, than lab numbers. Are you just to kind of piggyback on Zach's question, you know, specific to thyroid or, or other numbers that might fall out of range like that, that, that are 
you know, maybe don't match up with what we're used to, but at the same time, we don't see any clinical uh, issues. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important distinction to look at sort of if, whether it's clinical or subclinical hypothyroidism. And, you know, in general, I think when you look at these studies, and, and like you mentioned, Dr. Finney's written about this, where um, it, it seems that even when people have abnormalities in their TSH, there's no, they're not having any symptoms that would require you to, you know, change treatment or anything like that. Um, the other thing that's a little bit tricky with it is, you know, when people lose weight, oftentimes their, their need for different doses of thyroid hormone can change. Um, so that's something that we, we track over time and, and adjust as needed, but it ends up being, I haven't you know, noticed one overarching theme, and I certainly haven't been noticing tons of patients all, all of a sudden, you know, becoming hypothyroid. Um, I think a lot of those symptoms that people attribute to, um, whether it's thyroid or adrenal, adrenal fatigue or, you know, keto flu or things like that oftentimes can be remedied just with more sodium and more fluids, particularly initially. Um, that seems to address a lot of those kind of grab bag of symptoms that people have. Yeah, well, I guess let's go a little bit more into the, you know, because there, there is a lot about this keto flu and keto rashes and, you know, different constipation. So, I mean, what do you guys do in the transition phase? Because I'm, I'm, I'm sure a certain percentage of the patients will have some of those issues. Is this something that the health, health coach tackles or do you guys get into that directly yourself as physicians? Yeah, so we have some kind of basic guidance that the, the health coaches tend to use. And we also have, you know, educational materials like videos and quizzes and things like that that our patients will go through when they start and you know in general what we tend to do is is aim for probably about five grams of sodium um, per day um, initially and that seems to be kind of the sweet spot when you look at like the um, the pure study and other studies that look at that sodium intake um, but if somebody has super high blood pressure to begin with uh, they're on multiple meds we monitor their blood pressure and make sure that we're not telling them to you know overload on salt if they've are if, if they're maybe one of the rare people who's salt sensitive um, but so in general it's about getting the you know getting the sodium dialed in getting enough fluids um, the other thing I found is pretty important is to, you know, not have people strive so much for the rapid weight loss in that first couple of days or week. You know, it obviously feels good to look at the scale and see all the weight coming off, but oftentimes that's why people feel crummy <laughs> because they're, they're peeing out all their sodium and they're getting dehydrated. So, you know, a lot of it is this basic guidance and then eating enough fat, um, not necessarily you know, for some people, not overdoing it on the protein. Um, and then... I'd say for 90%, people actually have a pretty smooth transition. So a lot of what you hear traditionally with that keto flu um, in the past, I think people just weren't doing it quite right or not weren't focusing enough on electrolytes. Um, but then there is a small percentage of people who just have a bumpier ride. And that's where having the medical supervision is helpful to make sure that they're not, you know, the symptoms aren't worrisome or dangerous. Um, you know, we can adjust medications as needed. Um, or, and then sometimes we just find that the random person, it'll take them a couple weeks to, to get through those symptoms. But it's, it's much less than I feel like I used to see where people were doing it on their own. Yeah, let, let's, let's talk about that, the, the doing it on their own thing, because there, there are a lot of people that, that just do that. And in probably most cases it's fine, but there are people, and let's, let's talk about some of the common medications that need to be, or often need to be tapered and how to do that. I mean, you know, anti antihypertensives, diabetic drugs, some people will find, you know, their antidepressants, some people will find their pain medicines. How do you guys deal with that? And what are some of the common scenarios that you guys use? And is there an algorithm on how to do that stuff? Right. Yeah. And we know that a lot of people, obviously, from online communities, and you know, you've inspired a lot of people to make changes. And you know, for a lot of folks who don't have type two diabetes, who aren't on certain meds, it, it appears to be very safe for people to do it. And so, you know, we always tell people it's worth checking with your doc um, just to make sure that none of the meds you're on are, are concerning. Um, but you know, for for the majority of people or a lot of people, it, it's probably fine to do. Um, the ones that we really look out for tend to be, I think, first and foremost, the the hypoglycemic meds. So insulin would be the the top one, but then also the sulfonylureas like glipizide or glimepiride, um, because those ones. You know, if you if you cut out all your carbohydrates at the same time that you're taking a med that's going to independently lower your glucose, um, we see instances of people who you know before they join us who've had lows. 
Um, and so like, those are the, the big ones to really look out for. So I always tell anyone, if you're on insulin, you know, you really want to check with your doc or make sure you've got a, an ironclad plan for how to reduce those meds safely. And interestingly, like sometimes it actually even happens on the first day. So we'll, we'll make it, we'll cut people's insulin dramatically on the first day or two because they'll have such improvements. Um, and then the other one would be the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, so that's like Farziga or Jardians. And those ones are, you know, they have a risk of, we call it euglycemic DKA. So people will have DKA with a totally normal blood glucose. Uh, it's a rare side effect, but there's been some warnings about the combination of the medicine and a low carb diet as being a higher risk. So that's one that we tend to stop before people even make the dietary changes. And we always tell docs and patients just to be really careful about those meds because we have seen people again, before they joined us who, who were on those meds, started a ketogenic diet on their own and, you know, ended up in the emergency room. And then the, um, yes, about blood pressure meds as well. So the blood pressure ones, we're a little less aggressive with that. Most people, it can happen over time. Now, of course, if anybody's feeling dizzy and all of a sudden their, their blood pressure is 90 over 50, um, we'll make an adjustment. But usually that happens like at their follow-up visits with their PCP or if we see some clear, clear ways that we can get them off the meds. Jeff, let me ask you, I mean, I'm, I'm just going to, Take a take a take a guess here. It would seem like you end up deprescribing more than you do prescribing. It seems like, you know, you're you're taking more meds away than you're than you're adding to patients, and probably you're not having a lot of pharmaceutical reps drop by your door. You know, <laughs> congratulating you. Yeah, I mean, de <laughs> definitely. Um, we we kind of look at ourselves as as trying to be the you know, experts in in deep prescribing. Like we see a lot of I know you had Dr. Unwin on a while back and him talking about that. And it's it's really you know we found it to be kind of an art because you do have to. It's not that you just pull everything off willy nilly. You know you got to be careful about how you reduce them and how you monitor. Um, and that's something that it, you know feels a little weird. And given how I was trained as an internal medicine doc, you know you're definitely trained how to start medications, not, not take them off. Um, but I'd say it's probably, you know, 95% of my work is that. And if somebody does need a medication, we're able to prescribe and, and we'll do it if it's, if it's necessary. Um, but patients, you know, their, their goal is not to take medications for the rest of their life. You know, they want to be on the, the least amount that keeps them healthy, basically. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of odd that, you know, when we think about it, no one's really suffering from a deficiency of a particular pharmaceutical. I mean, that, that just really doesn't exist as a, as a pathology, but, you know, it seems like we, we, we pretend it does. But uh, let me get back, because I wanted to go back to the question about your own and the other physicians that might work. You talk about the satisfaction working in a company like Verda, and how has it changed your, you know, just your enjoyment of medicine and your outlook uh, as, as a physician from the physician's perspective? Yeah, well, I... Um you know, oftentimes we'll tell people, I feel, I feel like I have the best job in the world. And it was something that, you know, it was a lot, a lot of luck and a little bit of sort of, you know, reaching out to the, the right people at the right time and of, of taking a leap. And I, I owe, owe my wife a big debt of gratitude for letting me leave a, you know, pretty stable primary care job to be able to, to make the leap. Um, but, you know, in general, it's just an area where, we've got this group of physicians who are really passionate about this. And this is a kind of thing where, you know, we we're used to do it on our free time where, you know, reading, reading blogs, listening to podcasts and trying to, to learn about this in between patients and, and things like that. So to be able to dedicate my whole career at this point to, to this kind of approach is really gratifying. Um, and then again, you know, the, the ability to see so many of my patients get better is, is incredible. I think in an internal medicine, it can, you can get a little bit nihilistic, you know, when you start to see people and in general, you know, every visit, they're maybe a little bit sicker or they're on an additional med. And then you see people in the hospital and they're, you know, it's their fifth admission in, in as many months. So, you know, I think there's a lot of, of frustration out there by docs. And, you know, again, I just feel like this is an area where I've, I've stumbled into this <laughs> to some extent and have been able to, to take advantage of the opportunity. Jeff, one thing too, I want, wanted to ask kind of along some of these lines, just with the general, or the general procedure with, with Verda is like one interesting thing I've seen kind of pop up uh, more from the kind of the, the skeptics is just that, 
you'll have someone who reduces or gets rid of some of their medication or their blood sugar gets under control. And the, the rebuttal to that, I guess, is, well, if you went back to eating a standard American diet or a higher carb approach, if that those, those type two diabetes like symptoms return, then technically you didn't fix anything. You just put a bandaid on it. You know, my thought is, you know, well, if you're going to, if you're going to have a, a, a situation where you're improving based on making dietary changes versus, you know, taking some form of medication, that's probably a little more powerful than just saying a band aid. but what's kind of the view or the, the, the info that you maybe have in terms of, is that kind of the reality with a lot of these folks where it is about, you just have a much more narrow potential of dietary choices. If you want to manage this through food versus medication, or do you even see people return to the way they were eating before and not have those type two diabetes kind of return? Yeah. So we, we definitely see that there's, you know, it's not just the fact that they're not eating carbohydrates, which makes their glucose normal. You know, I think that we we've shown that uh, their insulin resistance improves um, that you have other improvements again, in things like blood pressure and overall weight loss. And you know, there, there have been studies that show that, you know, when someone loses five to 10% of their weight, there's a, a lasting effect, you know, for the next several years, at least where they have lower risk of heart disease, lower risk of cancer and, and other complications. So, you know, getting to that point, it's not like if you all of a sudden eat a sandwich and your blood glucose goes up that you've done nothing <laughs> positive for yourself. Um, you know, but, but certainly I think that there are some people who, you know, we have people who had diabetes for more than 20 years and it's probably unrealistic that they're going to be able to go back to eating a super high carb diet and eat whatever they want. And, you know, in reality, it's if they're, if they're eating kind of some of the foods that maybe got them there in the first place, um, even if they were well-meaning, a lot of times it's not that they're eating junk food. It's that they were eating a, a high carb diet that didn't work for, for them. Um, then I think that, you know, people do have to restrict to some, some degree in the long term. Um, and, and there's really, there's, some disagreement amongst folks around reversal versus re, you know, remission has a pretty strict definition um, from the ADA. Reversal is more of a new term that people are tending to use now. Um, but it, it does seem to make sense to me that, you know, that reversal can be if you're able to maintain a dietary and lifestyle intervention, your diabetes doesn't have symptoms and it doesn't have complications. And that's, I think, what people care about more than if I drank 75 grams of glucose, like what's going to happen to my blood sugar? Hey, Jeff, let me ask you another two-parter. So we had, you know, Professor Ben Bickman on yesterday. Just yeah, maybe listen to the episode when it comes out. Very interesting stuff. But, and, and this, this has come up re repeatedly in, in the last several years. On, you know, the omega-6 polyunsaturated fat, the seed oils in particular, seem to be at least something we're starting to recognize might be problematic. Is that something that your is part of your guys' uh, recommendation to limit those things or how do what, what do we do with those things and then the other uh, uh, question is what tools what are the what are the plans for Verde in the future are you guys hoping you expand get more physicians in the group and then what tools would you guys like to have access to that you don't have now right so you know around the the seed oils and the omega-6 you know it's definitely something that we um, tend to reduce. I mean, we don't completely avoid them in general, but I think, I mean, one of the issues that if you're eating a higher fat diet, um, there have actually been some, you know, basically we'll find that people have diarrhea and GI issues. There's sort of a level of tolerance of how much, you know, omega-6 oil you can tolerate. Um, and so we tend to steer more towards the monounsaturated fatty acids and then also the, the saturated fatty acids. And, you know, together with those sort of naturally occurring in real food, um, people tend to get enough of the fats that they need and, and, and feel good. Um, but certainly, sometimes people have some specific preferences or foods that they like, and, and we try to work with them to figure out how to, how to balance those different kinds of fats. But I, I think if you, if you can swing it, trying to stay, stay away from those PUFAs, I think tends to be a, a better idea. Um, oh, and then, and then the other question was around our uh, plant expansion. Is that right? Yeah. How, you know, are you going to grow? Are you going to, you guys going to look to hire more, more personnel and then, uh, you know, like I said, as a physician, what, what other tools would you guys like to have that you don't have now? 
Yeah, so we're, we're definitely actively expanding. You know, at this point, we're, we're hiring folks kind of all, all across the country, sort of mostly in um, areas like Denver, uh, Omaha, San Francisco, um, but a whole range of, um, of jobs. So if people are interested, you know, we've actually had some from some other podcasts I've been on, people who've heard and ended up um, applying and, and joining our team. So if anyone is interested in joining, I would definitely recommend it. There's a, a job site that's off of our vertahealth.com website. Um, and again, everything from sales to health coaching um, will be uh, we re recently hired a number of physicians, so we're not actively hiring right now, but in the next couple of months, we will be. Um, and the, you know, the overall goal is to expand, you know, obviously with more health, health insurance coverage across the United States and then eventually spreading internationally. And then in terms of the tools that we would love to have, you know, I, I think that in general, we've been somewhat device agnostic when it comes to different glucose meters and ketone meters and things like that. Um, you know, we can use what, what patients prefer. Um, you know, I think in the, the long term, it would be nice to have a little bit more connectivity in terms of, you know, CGMs that automatically upload all the data, um, you know, more, more connected devices. I think that getting more information can be helpful. Um, but right now we, we actually found that by people, checking their own glucose, checking their own ketones, uploading that information. They get a lot of feedback from that. And if I, I think if there, there's some concern if everything just automatically popped up, they may not think about it as much and, and try to make the changes. Do you guys have any, is there any, any sort of pushback against uh, your, 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 you know, this, the Verta Health stuff? Is there anybody that's sort of, sort of standing in the way or doesn't want you to succeed or anything like that that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, of course, there's the, you know, the arguments on Twitter and the, <laughs> the nutrition world, which, as you know, can be a bit combative. Um, but, you know, what, what we found is that, particularly within healthcare organizations and employers and everything, I mean, they know that diabetes is a huge problem. You know, it's probably their, their biggest source of cost. It's the most days of work missed. You know, it's, it's really hurting their employees. And so anything that is able to make a dent in that, we've seen, you know, support. I think the issue has been as we grow, we're fairly new and there's always a little bit of reluctance in healthcare to take on something that's not, um, that, you know, the, the clinic down the street isn't already doing. So there's definitely a follower effect in that regard. Um, you know, we've seen some pushback and folks, you know, it's kind of the plant-based diet community, um, but we, we really try similarly to the advice to the devices to try to stay somewhat agnostic in that if I have patients who are vegetarian and I have patients who are vegan and we're able to personalize our approach to be able to make it work for them, you know, it takes a little bit more work. It's a little bit more um, get into the weeds, but if somebody for cultural reasons, religious reasons, whatever it is, is vegetarian, we're not going to tell them to take a hike, you know, we're going to tell them to figure, figure out how to be successful. Um, but I mean, we believe that particularly if they've got type two diabetes, that they're going to need to restrict their carbohydrates. So if somebody wants to come in and do a super high carb diet, it's probably not, not a good fit. But if they are willing to restrict carbohydrates and work with us on finding sources of protein and, and fat, then, you know, we can work with folks. Do you have anything else we need to know? Is there any other, other stuff you think you, we, we, we haven't covered? Anything you'd like to discuss, you know, some of the findings you've had or some, some things, some tips that help, you know, say, you know, if you have a, you know, somebody listening that, you know, may not be able to do the Verta Health System for whatever reason, whether it's financial or geographic reasons or whatever it might be, what advice do you have for those people that want to embark on a, you know, say a low carb type diet that just, you know, you could, you could tell them. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I would say is that I would, I would go for it, you know, because I think the, the satisfaction and the results and the improved health that people get by, by taking control of their own health is just, it's kind of impossible to measure. Um, I've seen so much satisfaction from people who are able to, to take their health in their own hands and, and make those changes. Um, so, you know, it's not easy. And I think if you can get ways to get support, whether that's from your physician or whether it's an online community or whether it's, you know, someone like us at Verda, um, I definitely think that 
that that makes it more more likely to succeed. Um, but we know that some people out there, all they need to do is just get the right information and they can, can hit the ground running. Um, the other thing I would say is, again, if you're on insulin or diabetes meds, definitely check with a doctor first because it's, you know, re really important to, to stay safe. One other, you know, this is just a concept, you know, you know, we, 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 we tend to get our information or our evidence, you know, with regard to health or medical stuff, you know, kind of in a concentrated way, you know, that is, you know, we have a primary, primary investigator at, at an institution who, you know, decides this is what he thinks he wants to do. And, you know, he spends time getting it IRB approved and then funded and then done. And I think, you know, some of the information comes out very slowly that way. And sometimes it doesn't answer any questions or it can't be reproduced. I, you know, myself and guys like Tim Noakes and some of these other folks do think there is potentially a lot of uh, big, big potential out there in this online virtual, you know, you know, capacity we have to, to reach thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands, even, even millions of people that can all participate in gathering knowledge. And do you, do you guys see that, recognize that as a way to really hypercharge how we can figure out, figure out some of these problems, you know? putting it out, kind of crowdsourcing it, so to speak. Yeah, no, I think that the, the grassroots uh, kind of, you know, up swelling that's happening right now is amazing because I do think that it's, it's hard to, you know, be able for people to hide that this information is helpful and that, you know, and that it works. And again, it may not work for everybody, but, you know, one of the thing I like with your N equals one approach is to look at it and say, how does, how does it affect you? Like if you change what you're eating in this way, how does it affect your weight, your numbers? How do you feel, look and perform? You know, how, what are all these markers doing? And, you know, if somebody is going to tell you to, to not do something that's, that's helping, that you know is helping you, then I think we're going to continue to see this kind of backlash and the, and the more of the, the, the grassroots uprising that's been happening um, because people can't, you know, they, they can't, unsee what they've seen when they know that something works for them. Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of, you know, the cream will rise to the top, so to speak, for a high fat, you know, analogy there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's something we see. And, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And, and, and people will discard it. But I think that is, you know, I, I do think we're living in an age now with, you know, you and I talking from, you know, around the country and, and all these people being able to share their collective experiences is really going to change things dramatically. And, you know, and, and so the days where, you know, we had to wait for a study to come out in a journal uh, to get our information, you know, is, is just, I think that's, that's kind of going away. Uh, and I think I, ideally, or ultimately, I think for the better. Yeah, it seems like just from the data collection side of things, you know, if there's a positive with the amount of reach you have with social media and stuff, it's increasingly easier to kind of accelerate that process where you can collect a large amount of data on kind of how people are doing with certain approaches. And you know, you get enough of those voices saying, hey, this worked for me. That's when you kind of motivate um, the scientists more or less to, to look into it further. So I think uh, that that's a, a big positive and something that we can we can use going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think people, as much as it's just anecdotes and N equals one, I mean, that's, I think, what people are sort of hardwired to respond to. And, you know, it's pretty often where I'll even see it with my parents where they're a little skeptical of my advice initially, and then they see someone they know who's doing well with it. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, okay, well, this makes sense then. So yeah, I mean, I think that that, that kind of person to person spreading of information is, is definitely really powerful. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. Uh, let folks know how to get a hold of you if they want to get in, if they want to enter the, the Virto system. Say someone's a patient thinking about doing that. How do they contact you guys? How do they how do they find out about Virta? And you know, tell us again, tell us what you got coming up in the near future, and, and again, where people can find out more information. Yeah. So if anybody, um, again, we get a lot of our patients through their employer, but we also take patients who sign up directly and, and pay out of pocket. So anyone across the United States who wants to, to join Verda would just go to vertahealth.com and then there's a button near the top that says apply. And basically, it just sit, gathers some basic information. Uh, you set up a phone call to chat with somebody. There's, there's no obligation. You don't have to pay anything. We won't spam you. It's just to, to sort of get more information about, about what we're doing. Um, and then in addition, you know, if, if you know 
I imagine that, you know, a lot of your audience is probably people who are already doing this to some extent or already made some incredible improvements. But, you know, if you know friends or family members who feel better about having the medical supervision or who, you know, need to see a doctor because they're on insulin or other medications, um, you know, definitely consider um, directing them our way because we can definitely help with that and kind of smooth out some of the potential issues. Um, and then otherwise, you know, people can reach out to me. I'm on Twitter at uh, Jeff Stanley MD. Um, and um, also, if people are interested in applying to work for Verta at some point, can go to our website. Uh, there's a jobs link on there. And again, we're, we're actively hiring. So we'd love to get passionate folks to, to join the cause. Awesome, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for coming on the show. And uh, best of uh, wishes to you and all of the folks at Verta as you guys continue to grow. And it's, it's really cool to see that, that you guys have that system in place. And it's, it's taken off the way it has. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, thanks guys so much for having me. I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you. I'm a, a regular listener. So this was, it was kind of a treat. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.